Genesis chapter 7. Everybody found it? Say amen. amen. I'm beginning reading in verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all your house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast you shall take of thee by seven, the male and the female, and the beasts that are not clean, take them two, by male and his female. By fowls of the air, by sevens, the male and the female, to keep the seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Yet for seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth for forty days and for forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will be destroyed off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Skip over to verse 13. It says, And in the selfsame day entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Jepheth, and the sons of Noah, and the Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, and every bird of every sort. And they went into Noah, unto the ark, two and two, all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they all went in, went in male and female of flesh, and God made command of him, and the Lord shut him in. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. Let's pray. Father, I am just so very grateful for the opportunity to preach your gospel. I thank you for such a wonderful congregation. God, I just pray, Lord, that you would help us now to have ears to hear, but also courage to respond. Let the Holy Spirit of heaven, God, convict sinners. Let, let those that are lukewarm be heated by the fire of God. Let those that are straddling the fence be pulled over to the side of godliness. I pray, God, for your word to be yes and amen in this house. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Sister Amy, if you'll adjust camera number two for me. Camera number two, if you'll adjust that. Our normal camera workers are not in the building today, so we're having to do some makeshift stuff. You'll have to zoom out as well. This morning, I'm excited to preach about uh, part three of the series, Storms, Where Are They Leading You? Storms, Where Are They Leading You? The past two Sundays, I've preached about storms, which both involve Jesus. Um, one of the first storm I preached was Jesus was sound asleep on the back of the boat. The storm came up. The disciples got terrified, woke Jesus up. Jesus kind of rebuked them, and then he spoke peace to the winds and the waves. And then the second storm, last week's storm, if you remember, was when Jesus was not in the boat. And the disciples were all alone, and the winds begin to blow, and the waves begin to toss, and Jesus comes walking on the water. And uh, I mentioned last week that Peter said, hey, if that's really you, I got to get closer to you. And you remember that Peter was this marvel, and he stepped over the boat, and he walked on the water to get to where Jesus was. I remember making this very important message, uh, this very important point. It's important not to get caught up in the bling of being a water walker. Too many times Pentecostals get discouraged because they don't flow like somebody else, and they don't operate like other people operate. Don't get caught up in uh, missing the mission because you're discouraged about the bling. The mission was to get to the shoreline and to release the anointing of healing. It, th remember what your mission is. Don't let the bling, the disappointment of the bling cause you to stay too long in the wrong place and not fulfill the anointing that's on your life, the promise that's on your life to get you to the shoreline. Amen? Amen. Now today I want to preach on the very first storm ever recorded in history. A storm that forever shaped the earth and destroyed all life except for eight people and then a host of male and female animals. The story of Noah and the ark is one of the most popular stories in the Bible, maybe the most popular. It's known by people in the church as well as people outside of the church. But we want to make sure we take a look at what brought the storm about in the first place. These people seemed to live in this great place of prosperity. They had water from the ground that nourished the plants, and life seemed to be going along so well. But the people over the years had forgotten about the God who created them. And life had begun to be twisted on the earth. As a matter of fact, some scholars would say at this point, life has been on the earth for over 1,600 years. 
and wickedness begins to take over. You'll remember it was here during this season that uh, divine beings began to be attractive to earthly women and the angels of God began to have relations with the women of the earth and created giants from their unholy unions. And God begins to see the wickedness of humanity and he began to be so discouraged because the people of the earth could only imagine evil. And all they wanted to do was evil. And it saddened the heart of God. As a matter of fact, God says it made him uh, just feel, be filled with pain. And he says, I am, and I'm using my words, I am disgraced that I ever made people. God says, I'm going to do away with my ruined creation. It breaks my heart that I ever created them. But as he looked over a group of people that he wanted to just wipe off the face of the earth, he found one godly man, one man of integrity, one man without fault in his generation, a man that lived close to God and in love with God. So God decided to spare Noah, and because of grace, everybody say grace, and because of grace, he spared not only Noah, but Noah's three sons and their wives and also Noah's wife. Noah was a man of righteousness. He was given to the plans, and God sent him a part and said, here's what I want you to build. Here's the blueprints. Build it exactly the way I tell you to build it. Noah was given this incredible blueprint to build this massive ark to save he and his family. God saw something in Noah that he could not find in anyone else, and he was able to trust Noah with his plans. My first question for you this morning is, can God trust you? with his plan of escape. Can God trust you with his plan of escape? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except <clears throat> what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but will with every temptation, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Listen, church, God always provides a way out. God always has an escape plan. God always has given a design to get out. He's always given somebody the plan of the ark to build and escape. But the problem is with the world we're living in is we, like the people of Noah, have become so consumed with evil. And all of our thoughts are evil. And all of our wants are evil. And all of our desires are evil. And all of our actions are evil. And we're so blind to the escape. And we're so blind to the way out. And instead of running away, away from the issues of evilness instead of running away from the causes of our lust and our pride and our sensualities all of a sudden we forget forget to get away from that we forget to shun the very appearance of evil and we get deeper into our stuff and we get, get caught up into the pleasures of the world we but continue to eat we continue to drink we continue to celebrate as if judgment is not coming just as it was in the days of Noah oh church we've got to be careful we cannot get caught up in our selfish ambitions. We cannot think living a good lifestyle will rescue us from the coming flood of judgment. We must remember that we're not judged by the laws of men. We're not judged by the comparisons of wickedness, nor are we judged by the alignment of political forces in our lives. We are held accountable by a higher standard of the Word of God. And we must realize that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to God the Father. It's not based on your good works. Rather, it's based on His mercy and His grace. And may I dare say in the church world, we're just as they were in the days of Noah. We go through our times of gathering. We go through our seasons of prayer. We sing our songs of celebration. Oh, but how far away are we from the standard of holiness and the standard of righteousness? We must come back to the place to where God is God and he's the only way to get to heaven oh once again judgment will flood the earth are you at a point to where you can be trusted with the escape plan are you counted worthy are we running into the ark of God's safety is Jesus the way that you realize that he's the only way you're going to get there? Listen to me, rising fine. Jesus is the only way. You're not going to get there from any other God, little G. You're not going to get there from any other kind of feel-goodism. You're not going to get there from any kind of motivational talk from, from, from the iPods and the, and the, and the podcast uh, across the nation. You're not going to get there by the way Oprah tells you to get there, and you're not going to get there by the latest political proponents. There's only one way to get to Father, and that is Jesus Christ, born of 
a virgin, crucified as a man, buried in three days later in resurrection. God sent his only begotten son to save you of all your sins, and he is the one and the only way to get to the Father. Oh, I got two people awake today. The rest of you just hang on because I'm about to scrape the paint off your walls. The people of Noah's day did the same thing we're doing in the church. We're rejecting God. Not rejecting the church. Oh, yes, there's a mass falling away. We're not rejecting the church. We're just rejecting the God of the church. We're just rejecting his holiness and his righteousness. Oh, we've come together to have great social gatherings. And we come together to have great friendship circles. But the problem is, as it was in the days of Noah, we're turning our backs on the creator. And, and our lives are being filled with adversities of heaven. And we're being surrounded with evil and its lust. Oh, church, we better watch out. Our lives are becoming full of wickedness, full of evil. We are rejecting the holiness and the standard of God. Even people in the church are turning away from righteousness. We're relying on the promises of reward without sacrifice, religion without relationship. Oh, we got to be cautious. Let us be warned. Luke chapter 17, verse 26 and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married their wives. They were given in marriage until the day, of the, until the day Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Oh, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Whoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you this, in the night there will be two men, one in the bed, one shall be taken and the other shall be left. There will be two women grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. And I declare two in the church and one shall be taken and one shall be left. I ask you this morning, where are your storms leading you? Are you able to enter into the ark of God's safety? Whatever you do, child of God, don't reject God and his teachings. Don't reject God and his holiness. Don't reject God and his way out. Don't reject God and his higher standard. His way leads to life abundant and life eternal. Trust in him. Repent of your sins so that you can enter the ark. Let God trust you with the escape plan. Oh, your storms are trying to lead you to a place of confession your storms are trying to lead you to a place of repentance. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of all of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Kerry Newhoff, in his book, Didn't See It Coming, writes about confession. He writes, Confession is the part of prayer and life where we come before God and one another to admit all that we aren't, our shortcomings, our inattentional sins and the myriad of unintentional. We confess our brokenness. We admit that we are not all we pretend to be, hope to be, could be. We own up to the fact that we are a mess. He concludes that we're living in a day where we have developed an allergy to the application of the word sin in our lives. After all, nobody seems to make mistakes in the days we're living in. Newhoff says we avoid confession because it requires us to look into the mirror. It demands revealing the real you that you don't want anybody else to see. We, re we refuse to, to surrender to God and to shift away from confession. And it leaves most of us in a precarious state, particularly along, among younger adults adults, teenagers, and children who are raised in a society that ignores sin. Hey, church, we better be careful because our lack of confession disconnects us from God. It disconnects us from one another, and it will even disconnect us from ourselves. Don't allow your storm to lead you to a place where you begin to blame someone else for your problems. Don't allow your storms to lead you to a finger-pointing session, but be willing to confess your sins. Be willing to confess your shortcomings. Be willing to confess your mess. Jesus wants to open the door of salvation, but you got to stop hiding behind society's ideas of sin or the lack thereof. And you must begin to own up to your sins so that you can be saved. And in the church, 
I've got a word for you. Remember, there's two in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two grinding. One will be taken. One will be left. Two in the bed. One will be left and one will be taken. Just because you're acting active in the building does not mean you're active in the right relationship with Jesus. Are you really? Even though because of tradition and because of custom and maybe because of habit, are you in the place you need to be with Jesus are you really in a holy defined what God would call right? Not what man calls right relationship. It's not very hard for man to tell Ella she's good. It's not very hard for man to tell Timmy he's very good. It's not hard for man to tell Penny, hey, Sandra, and Sandra she's good. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about getting somebody else to tell you how good you are. I'm talking about does God, according to the righteous words and the way he will judge you, declare you are righteous? Samuel Rodriguez once said, when you think your gift will take you further than gr grace, your destiny will die. When you think your gift will take you further than grace, your destiny dies. Anytime you think you've made it this far in life because of your gifts, your abilities, intelligence, skills, awareness, determination, drive, contacts, or courage, you're sadly mistaken. The devil loves to make you think you can win your war with evil all by yourself. Listen, the devil loves to make you think, oh, you got this. Don't be left out of the ark of salvation because you thought too much of yourself. Don't be left out of the saving grace of God because you thought too much of your own abilities. Don't be left banging on the door of the of the ark begging God to let you in when it's too late don't be like the five virgins that were foolish and the bridegroom comes and the door is locked and they're begging oh please let us in if you wait too long the door will close and you will be left outside banging to get in every time you think that what you have is bigger than what God has your pride will defeat you you need to confess and you need to run into the safety of God's ark of salvation. And listen, for a church full of people who claim salvation, a church full of people who out of habit come to church, out of tradition in the Bible belt comes to church, it takes a lot of reckless faith to step up and go, oh my goodness, Jesus, remove my, the scales from my eyes. Amy, flip the heat on. I see three people with jackets on. I must be the only one that's hot, and that's okay. I shall sweat. It takes reckless faith to pray, God, remove the scales from my eyes and remove the hardness from my heart. But it also takes reckless faith to build an ark and to tarry long enough to see it through. When God decided he wanted to judge the wickedness of the earth, it was 120 years before rain came. Noah walked, worked on the ark for 75 years before a cloud ever appeared in the sky. But Noah kept building, and he kept testifying that judgment was coming. Listen, I know some of you have heard it your whole life. You've been, if you've been in church, you've heard it, and you've heard it, and you've heard it. You've heard people talk about Jesus is coming in 88. He's coming in 90. He's coming in 98. In 99, he's coming at the year 2000. Surely that's the signs of an end of times when we cross over the millennial. Surely that was when Jesus was going to come. Listen, I know you're getting tired of hearing it, but what I do know is that because he didn't come in 2020, I know that he, we're closer in 2021 than we were in 2020, but I want to make sure that I'm able to endure to the end because it's not the one that starts it's the one that finishes it's not the one that's able to get baptized it's the one that keeps on going when everything else fails you got to make it to the bitter end oh for 75 years Noah's mocked laughed at scorned but then one day one day as Noah kept on building kept on building God told him, you better get in the boat, son, it's time. And all of a sudden, God's angels slammed the door shut. For seven days, Noah stayed there inside a locked door before rain ever failed. Seven days, I can imagine, clouds began to billow in the air. Seven days, I can only imagine, as storm clouds that they've never seen before. The darkness of day begins to take over, and the people begin to come to the boat and wondering what's about to happen. Maybe they're banging on the door, asking to get in, and all of a sudden, lightning begins to flash, and storms begin to rage, and winds begin to go, and for the first time in the history of the world, water begins to fall from the sky, and to help the earth flood faster, not only did it fall from the sky, the streams began to open, 
overflow and the, the wells beneath the earth begin to burst up out of the earth and the people are now banging on the door letting us in. The very same people that mocked them are now begging Noah to open the door but God had already sealed it. Oh, it takes reckless faith to keep going when everybody else turns away. It takes reckless faith to keep standing when everybody else seems to think you're foolish. Beth Guckenberger writes in her devotional Reckless Faith that it takes reckless faith to build an ark before there's a cloud. It takes reckless faith to charge into the sea before God splits the water. It takes reckless faith to leave 99 sheep to go after that one. It does not need men's approval, nor does reckless faith need man's money. Reckless faith will honor God in the classroom even when no one else reveres him. Reckless faith does not make moral compromise at the office even when they're expected. A reckless faith believes in death to us part. Reckless faith does not mean immature and unthinking. But the closer I get to God, the more recklessly I desire to live because I realize if I'm going to make it today, it's not going to be a normal kind of faith. I'm asking you today to have some reckless faith. Admit that you need God. Admit that you're falling back. Admit that you're at a backslidden place. And have some reckless faith. Keep building. Run to the shelter to let the storms of your life lead you into the arms of God. Rise and fall. And it's going to take reckless faith for us to see all that God wants us to see in the spirit realm. Oh, are we satisfied with where we are? And then in March the 7th, this building is going to look full because we're going to combine services, even though it's not full because there'll still be wall, hundreds of chairs stacked around the building. And we've got promises that have been promised. And we've had people from other countries prophetically to care that this house would be filled. We've got all kinds. Are we willing to to let prophecies die and fall to the floor? Are we willing to let promises be unbirthed? Or will we decide, God, give us some reckless faith? Let us step out and do some things we've never done before. Rally a church with some reckless faith, God. Pastor Chris, you don't know what kind of hell on earth I've been fighting. You don't know what kind of stuff I'm in. But here's one thing I know. God is still God. And maybe you've been in terrible storms and they're trying to lead you away from the cross of Calvary. They're trying to lead you away from the saving grace of Jesus. But today, I've decided I'm shifting my sails. My storms are going to lead me back to Jesus. My storms are going to lead me back to his peace. My storms are going to lead me back to his joy. Where are your storms leading you? Let those storms drive you to the deliverer. Oh, it's time to board the ark of safety. Listen, <laughs> I wish it was just as easy as getting on the boat, surviving family. Y'all know family can be hard to survive locked up in an ark. Even the compound sometimes separates. I asked in the first service, and I'm going to use the Ely's for this because y'all just happen to be who I saw. You ever been on a long road trip with children? And before long, Chloe touches Mackenzie, and Mackenzie says, Stop touching me! Y'all ain't been gone but an hour, and you got 10 more hours to go. And they're fighting already. You in Chattanooga, and they're already fighting about what we're watching on the DVD player. They're already fighting over, when can we start playing on our apps? Can we start using data now, Daddy? Can we start using data now, Daddy? Can you imagine being closed in? Because, see, they were on the boat seven days before rain came. Door slammed shut, looking out as the clouds billowed in. And then it was 40 days they were on the boat without any kind of sign. But then there was another 320 days, roughly 320, 24 days. They were in the boat 364 plus days based on what calendar you want to look at. Over 360 days, they were locked in that boat together. That's hard enough to survive by itself. Sham's wife getting all over Jeff F's wife. Good grief. But they realize, even at the end, and, and the play we saw de depicted it so wonderful. They began to fight about which animals was going to get the most hay because they were running out of hay. They were running out of stuff. And who's going to get to be fed now? Are, are your elephants going to get to eat or are the orangutans going to get to eat? Who's going to eat now? I mean, all of a sudden, they're, they're in a battle because food is running out. Can you imagine the stress? I guess what I'm trying to tell you is some of you have been locked in for a long time. And you're thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm running out of provision. I'm running out of food. I'm running out of patience. I'm running out of, uh, of hope. I'm running 
hang out of love for this family member. Just keep hanging in. Yes. Just, just keep hanging in because dry ground will happen again. Yes. Pastor David Henderson Tori told a story of uh, John Kavanaugh about a conversation he had when John met Mother Teresa. Upon John meeting Mother Teresa, he asked her to pray that he would have clarity like she's got. Mother Teresa responded, no, I will not do that. Clarity is the last thing you're clinging to and you must let go of. She explains to John, I have never had clarity. What I've always had is trust. So she said, I will pray that you have trust. Today, some of you are asking and you're begging God for clarity about your life. You're asking God to help you with the cloudiness and the blackness of your days. You're begging God to show you the way, to explain himself, show you the next step. God is saying, you don't need clarity. You need trust. And today, I promise you, you need to beg out and say, God, give me trust. I don't care what I see. I don't care what I understand. I know it doesn't make sense. God, I don't need to see anything, but I got a hold of the unchanging can. I I trust you, God. Let God help you get through the situation. Trust him. This morning, some of you are begging God to make sense of your craziness. And God has said, I ain't going to do it, but I will give you trust. Amen. Some of you are trying to get sense of your husband. God is saying, you ain't going to never understand it. No, husbands are trying to understand their wives. And God is saying, you ain't never going to understand them. Just trust me. Some of you are trying to understand your kids. You ain't never going to understand them. You trust God with them. The doors of the ark are open for now. You've got to repent. You've got to confess. You've got to begin to trust God with all of your heart. Come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. Sister Nikki, I'm closing. Today you've got to let your storm drive you into safety. You've got to allow your storms to drive you into his safety. Here's the command of Noah that I believe God is giving our church. At the end, Noah is commanded as they exit off. Now, y'all go and multiply and replenish this earth. Animals go off and they begin reproduction. They, the children of Noah begin reproduction. I believe what God is saying is, come on, I've been sparing, rising, fine. I've kept you around so that you begin to reproduce king, kingdom people. It's time for sheep to begin to begot sheep. It's time for sheep to begin to have sheep. Now listen, God has been giving me, and I don't know when and where I'm going to be allowed to teach to pastors, but he's been, he's been giving me some stuff about shepherds lately that I'm taking notes on. Because shepherds have responsibilities. But it's the sheep that have more sheep. Do we want this church to truly have 306 people in it? That's how many chairs we have. We'll take Nikki's out of the sound room and that other one, they'll have to sit in met folding chairs because somebody else will need the comfortable gray chair. Then you got to get off the boat when God brings you to a land of season of rest and begin to reproduce spiritually. It's time for the church to begin to have spiritual babies. Some, thank you, Amy. It's time for the church to begin to realize, are we going to grow? It will be because we go. Are we going to prosper? It will be because we do the things to prosper. And I ain't talking about financially. I'm talking about will we prosper spiritually? Will we prosper with increase? It will be because we decided it was time to follow the command of Noah and reproduce in the kingdom. Who are you going to get saved? I've often said this, Ella, and today's Ella's day to get called on. Sorry. I've often said this many times, actually. If everybody just brings one person, the church doubles in size in one week. That doesn't even sound like it's a hard time. I know Sister Brenda can find somebody to come to church. She's fun to be around. Sandra, you, have y'all seen those filters uh, on Snapchat and uh, I don't not Snapchat Instagram, you know, and it looks like they've got glitter all around them. Sandra looks like that. The lights just hitting her little shirt. I see sparkles all around Sandra Chitwood. She just looks so pretty. Just she's got a she's wearing her spiritual filter today. And listen, but you know what? That seems so easy. 
that if, that if Tony can just get one person to come to church and get saved? Just one. What if we, if we designated a month for you to win one person? A month sounds like too long to have to convince somebody to come to church with you. What if I said try to win one person in a year? That sounds like a way too long to win somebody. But yet we've got people that's been serving in this church 50 plus years and have never brought anybody nor saved anybody. And y'all are quiet as a church mouse. Except for that one in the old church. Y'all remember that Sunday morning a, a church mouse got loose and started running back and forth in front of the stage? Most excitement we've seen in a long time. Listen. I'm offering you a challenge that I didn't offer the first group. You've been in Christ too long not, not to have done something for Him yet. Well, I'm building me up. You're really supposed to be building the kingdom up. You're not called to build up yourself except by praying in the Holy Ghost. But when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you'll go find somebody to give Jesus to. Thank you, Brittany. I love that affirmation. You better stand. So this went totally different than my set first service, which is why I'm, I can't wait to be back to one service. But I just feel so strongly in my spirit that it's time for some of y'all to ask God to, and this is a horrible southern phrase. God, we need you to crank our tractor again. Because we just sitting, we sitting flat tires. <laughs> we look like a tractor, but we ain't, we, we ain't no good. Now, I believe God has called us to be good. I believe he's called us to endure some storms so that we can, he can open the door and we can go multiply. I really believe that. I believe that God can bring us out of the ark and take us to people to replenish his kingdom. Time is running out. Jesus is coming soon. I need Cooper to be able to find people to give to Jesus. I, I need Ava and Ivory, and I need Hayden and, and River to be able to, to give somebody Jesus. I, I, I need da uh, Dawson to be able to find somebody and Logan to, to, to show them the love of God and give them Jesus, bring them to church so they can get discipled. Oh, I need Brody to find another little guy they can bring to church. Oh, we need it. We need the wall girls to be able to leave the comfort of their surroundings and, and go and find somebody that needs Jesus. And then every adult, we, hey, Elijah, I ain't going to leave you out. Chloe McKenzie, we need you. We need you. But mamas and daddies, why would they ever do it when they've never seen you do it? How can I beg our kids to win people for Jesus when you've not won anybody for Jesus? If they saw the fervency of soul winning from you, they would automatically do it. If they saw you so excited hearing you around the table instead of talking about how mean the preacher is and when's Pastor Chris going to have a lease and we can finally have a new pastor. It's been 12 years since we had a new pastor we could invite to our house. I ain't bringing him into my home no more. God, give us a new pastor. Instead of you saying that, and they heard you saying, hey, honey, you ain't going to believe what happened. I witnessed to a guy today on the street right outside of Dollar General. He gave his life to Jesus. I'm going to pick him up Sunday morning. He's coming to church with me, and we're going to disciple that man to love Jesus. If they heard that kind of excitement, wouldn't that automatically spill down on them? Where's your storm leading you? Where is your storm taking you? Oh, God, take me to the ark of salvation. But then release me, God, to touch the people of my community and my region. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to pray a prayer right now that God releases us from the ark and releases us into our community. That's a whole sermon all by itself. Maybe I should have preached that next week. Father, I am thankful. God, you, you totally took this sermon at the end, a uh, uh, direction I never even thought of. So, God, I know that means it was the direction you wanted it to go. And, God, I don't want to feel, let anybody feel condemned by my words. That was not the purpose, God, of your statements. So I come against the spirit of condemnation. God, those who feel guilty. No, God, I don't want them to feel guilty. I do want us all to feel convicted. 
that we're called to be people that will go into all the world while we settle in our church pews. So God, I'm asking you to God, let the ark's door down that we've been floating in for 300 plus days. Let the land be dry so we can step out, experience a season of peace and begin to witness to those around us that we can get people saved, get them into the house of God, disciple them so that they can also win people and disciple them so they can be called, chosen, set apart, and sent. Do it, I pray, God. Do it, I pray, God. Don't let us be frustrated because we're at the end of the journey when the promises are about to be fulfilled. Oh, my Lord. Don't let us give up right about the time the greatest harvest is going to take place. Help us to endure in Jesus' name. I'm coming out of prayer because I wanted you to make sure you hear what I just prayed to the prayer, which was the Spirit praying for me. I just feel the Spirit of the Lord saying, be careful not to give up when the greatest harvest is about to take place. Don't give up when the door of the safety is about to be opened. And the greatest revival of the world is about to take place. Rising fun, let us not kill each other right here at the very end. Let us not escape out of the back door of the church trying to find another church to satisfy our needs and our pleasures. No, 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 don't, don't give up now. We're about to move into a season as it was in the books of Acts where people are added to the church daily. We're about to experience that kind of move. Don't get mad at each other. Don't stab each other in the back. Don't run away. Don't curse each other. Don't destroy each other. I know the journey's been long. I know we're frustrated. I know we've been idle for a long time. We've been waiting for the water to, 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 to recess. But God is saying, I'm about to open the door for the greatest harvest ever. Don't give up, people of God. Don't give up. I'm going to pray one more prayer, and then I've got to stop. Because the children's church is overflowing today. A lot of our kids brought a lot of visitors. Thank God. Thank God for, for doing that. Now, you mamas and daddies do it next week. I don't even know how all of them got here. Two cars, I guess. Listen, I'm going to pray God make us usable and then use us. Stretch your hands up toward heaven. Let me pray over you. Father, I pray right now. As people's hands are stretched and those who don't even have their hands up, I pray a double dose over them that you'd make us usable. Forgive us for hardness. Forgive us for stubbornness. Forgive us, oh God, for backbiting, for doubt, for frustrations. Forgive us, God, for aggravations. Forgive us, God, for the sin of complacency. And I pray, oh God, you would create in us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us. I pray, oh Father, that you would make us usable. And I pray a spirit of release over the members of the Rising Fine Church of God. Release us, oh God. Use us, I pray. Use us, I pray, to win the lost for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, clap your hands, all your people. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, God is good. Listen, Wednesday night, I don't know if you know this. Some of you realized it because we had new people in church Wednesday night. We have Wednesday night Bible study.